up, everybody? And welcome to another episode. Hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and share the video. <clears throat> Excuse me, hit the join button and become a member. Why? Well, members get exclusive content. Hit the bell icon on my channel so that you'll receive a notification every time I drop a video. And you can go and check the video out. Let's get into it. I saw this footage on Malcolm X some time ago. And this is a perfect time for me to get into it and do a, a bit of a reaction to it. Although, for the most part, I'm going to let Malcolm X do the speaking. Here he's on a show called City Desk in 1963. And all four of these white people are very racist. They're not hiding the facts. Uh, they're not hiding that fact. And they're trying to play intellectual gymnastics with Malcolm, not understanding and realizing that he is a brilliant man. And his emotional intelligence and his poise stands out in this footage. Though they try to trap him, he keeps his cool and sticks to his guns. Let's get into it. Let Malcolm do the talking. Good afternoon. No matter what your point of view may be, there is significant in the growth in Chicago and across the United States, if not around the world, of a movement known as the Black Muslims, a movement which is popularly believed to preach a doctrine of hatred for the white race and the ultimate supremacy of the Negro race. The headquarters of the Muslim movement is here in Chicago in the 5300 block of South Greenwood, and its leader now is known as Elijah Muhammad. He's in residence here. The most active person in the spreading of the black Muslim movement is Elijah Muhammad, second in command, who calls himself Malcolm X. And Malcolm X is our guest today on City Desk. Across the desk, our panelists this week are NBC newsmen Charles McCune, Floyd Calver, and Len O'Connor. And Mr. X, may I begin by asking you, if you will please, outline us for us the platform and policies of the Muslim organization. Well, the platform that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our religious leader, uh, stands upon is the platform of complete freedom, justice, and equality for the 20 million black people, that, uh, or so-called Negroes, here in America. And he teaches us that uh, because of the seriousness of the condition that our people now find themselves in, that it's uh, absolutely impossible to solve our problems uh, with means other than religion. And he teaches us that the religion of Islam is the only religion that will uh, instill within our people the incentive to stand on our own feet. And instead of trying to force ourselves upon whites or force ourselves into the white society or blame the white man for our predicament and, and constantly beg him for what he has, he says that the only way that we can uh, solve our problem is to unite together among ourselves, among our own kind, uh, clean ourselves up, rid ourselves of the evils that we've uh, become addicted to here in this society and try and uh, solve our problem ourselves. And uh, I referred to the popular belief that the Muslims preach a hatred for the white race. You do not subscribe to this? Then. No, uh, I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teach or preach hatred for anyone. He, he preaches hatred against evil against drunkenness, against dope addiction, against poverty, and against uh, having to beg for the things that a man is supposed to have. Uh, but I've never he uh, heard him teach us or any of his followers hatred toward any human being. Do you think that some of his followers possibly then have misinterpreted the word that they've heard and follow a practice of hatred for the white race? I don't think that any Muslim practices hatred toward anyone. Uh, we have businesses around the country that are... Uh, uh, patronized by whites and we have many businesses here in Chicago and our customers are white as well as our own kind and a white person can go into any of these places of business and he'll have to admit that he is uh, treated with more respect and he finds more dignity there than he will find among the so-called Negroes who profess 
to be teaching uh, love for everyone. You've had twice you've referred to, to the Negroes, uh, the so-called Negroes. You, you find uh, some fault with this description, yes. I gather. Mr. Muhammad teaches us that uh, Negro is a term that was applied to us during slavery by the slave master. And to write it right today, it's a term that is used only to point out the descendant of slaves. It's never used for black people, period. Africans can come to this country. They aren't called Negroes. And if they are called Negroes, they resent it. So if Negro meant black, as we've been taught, it would be a term that would be applicable to or pliable to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but he says that it is something that means a slave or something who is, it means something uh, that has been left out of society, politically, economically, uh, educationally and otherwise. You don't think of it as an anthropological term? Definitely. It's not an anthropological term. It's a slave term. And it was a term that was invented in America and was used by the slave makers, slave traders, and slave masters and attached to the property or the chattel uh, or merchandise that our people represented in that particular day. Mr. O'Connor. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Have you been to court to establish the I show? Don't, I, I didn't have to go to court to be called Murphy or Jones or Smith. Excuse me for answering you this way. That's if right. a Chinese person were to say his name... <clears throat> the nerve of this guy here. He's asking Malcolm, what is your real name? Malcolm said, Malcolm, Malcolm X. And he says, did you, have to go, did you go to court to establish that? the unmitigated audacity of this guy, O'Connor. Did we have to go to court to be slaves? Did we have to go to court to be lynched and abused? No, but we have to go to court <clears throat> and get your permission to change our name? The audacity, and he keeps trying to get Malcolm to say what his original name is or was and and or what his father's original name is or was and then Elijah Muhammad. But Malcolm, as you're going to see, is going to stick to his guns. He's not going to recognize it. I don't know none of that. I told you my name is Malcolm. Malcolm freaking X. My name was Patrick Murphy. Uh, you would look at him like he's insane because uh, Murphy is an Irish name, uh, a European name, or the name that uh, has a Caucasian or, or a white background. And a yellow person, Chinese is a yellow man, and uh, he has nothing to do or no connection whatsoever with the name Murphy. And if it doesn't look proper for a person who is yellow or Chinese to be walking around named Murphy or Jones or Johnson or Bunch or Powell, uh, I think it would be just as improper for a black person or the so-called Negro in this country, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to walk around with these names. And therefore, he teaches us that during slavery, the same slave master who owned us uh, put his last name on us to denote that we were his property. So that when you see a Negro today who's named Johnson, if you go back in his history, you'll find that he was once his grandfather or one of his forefathers was owned by a white man who was named Johnson. If his name is Bunch, his, his grandfather was owned by a I white man point. that was uh, named Bunch. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. My father got his last name from his grandfather, and his grandfather got it from his grandfather, who got it from the slave master. The real I names of our people were destroyed during slavery. Was there any, was there any line, uh, any point in, in the uh, genealogy of your family when you did have to use the last name, and if so, what was it? The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when Stick they were brought to, it, to America Malcolm. and made slaves. Period. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refuse. We reject that name today. Okay. You, you mean you won't even tell me what your father's anybody. supposed last name was or no. gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the, the status of Elijah Muhammad. First of all, is he ill? I spoke to him today. He is in better health than he has been. He's suffering from asthmatic bronchitis. Is that why he didn't attend your rally on last Tuesday? Yeah, the only reason that he didn't attend was his uh, ill condition. And the weather here, especially on that particular day, was of such nature that it would have been almost insane for him to come. Well, now, did you hold that meeting last Tuesday because it coincided with the uh, general election, the primary election? 
I think if you study the history of Mr. Muhammad's work and religious work in this country, he's been, we've had our convention on February the 26th every year for, I think, the past 33 years. Well, now, while, while you don't uh, care to discuss your former name or the name that the slave master gave to your go. antecedents, it, go. Uh, it is a matter of record that uh, Muhammad's last name was Poole, Elijah Poole. No, that's the name that his slave master gave to his uh, grandfather or great grandfather. That's not his name. Stick well, his mother it. and father thought when they called him Elijah Poole that that was his name. They right? didn't know any better. Well, if they didn't know any better or not, that, they thought that was his name. Yes, sir. But, sir. Well, what I'm trying to find out is when did he cease to be Elijah Poole and get to be Elijah Muhammad? In 1931, I think it was, in Detroit, he was taught the true history of our people and made aware at that time that he was wearing an English name, and by not being an Englishman, he looked out of place. And uh, his teacher gave him the name that he's wearing today, Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad. All right, now when did he become what he purports to be in your literature, the son of Allah? I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad referred to as the son of Allah. The prophet of Allah. Of Allah I've never heard him referred to as the prophet of Allah. What do you refer to him Messenger as? of Allah. All right, the messenger of Allah, and I... Appreciate the correction. Yes, I mean, he says that a prophet is somebody who predicts the future, and he's not predicting the future, whereas a messenger is someone who carries a message that has been given to him by one who authors that message. Well, now, who gave him the message, and to whom is it supposed to be delivered? Master W.F. Muhammad, the one who taught him, is the author of the message. He gave it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which makes him the messenger. And he's to deliver that message of truth and righteousness to the 20 million American so-called Negroes, which means he's to teach us the truth which will awaken us and then show us how to live a life of righteousness which will automatically qualify us for recognition as human beings by all other righteous human beings here on this earth. Well, now, one other question. Uh, with reference to what Mr. Hurlbut asked you a little bit ago, uh, you took a very moderate position of... Uh of wanting independence without having any hatred for the for the whites is that is, do I understand that correctly hatred is not involved in it whatsoever well I recall uh, in a recent plane crash I mean two or three years ago or less than that a charter flight on Air France uh, in which a group of people from Atlanta Georgia uh, were as they say in the uh, business uh, as they took off from uh, from Arley Field, and you were quoted at that time as expressing great gratification that this tragedy had occurred. Do you recall that? I recall it. What uh, did you say? Was, Do you remember? Uh, the press miss. So he's referring to Malcolm, as he just said. So he says, well, Malcolm, you took a very, a very moderate position when the other guy first was questioning Malcolm and saying that the nation of Islam teaches hatred. And he said, Malcolm, you took a, veter a very moderate position in your response when Malcolm said, no, he doesn't teach hatred. He teaches hatred of drunkenness. He, he, teaches, he teaches hatred of, of begging, but he doesn't teach, teach hatred of any human being. <clears throat> so now this guy says, well, you took a very moderate position. In other words, you know, you won't admit that you guys are racist or that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches racism. However, Malcolm, he said, a plane crashed. There was a plane crash where a lot of white people had died on the plane crash. And these white people were from Atlanta, Georgia, as he just said. And Malcolm, as he said, was quoted, I remember, and Malcolm later said he wished he had never said that. That's one of the things that he wished he had never said. He had, he ne he had never apologized for it, though. Had essentially said that it was a blessing that the plane had crashed and that all of those white people had died. And so he's saying, you're saying that you're not racist, but why would you say that? Let's hear Malcolm's response as to why he said what he said about the plane crash. I'll let Malcolm speak for himself. Interpreted it and misrepresented it. What did you say? They said that it was made at a Muslim meeting. It wasn't. 
It was made at a rally of Negroes, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, and otherwise in Los Angeles, who were rallying to protest the brutal shooting of uh, seven unarmed Negroes and what did you by say? heavily armed white policemen in the city of Los Angeles. And because we are a people who have been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to never carry weapons of any kind, but to get on God's side and rely on God to fight our battles for us, uh, at the time that these brothers were shot down so brutally, I pointed out at the <laughs> funeral of the brother who died that God would step in and take a hand in giving us some form of justice for the brutal killing of our brother. And when the plane crashed in France, uh, I pointed out to the crowd at this rally that this was an act of God showing his wrath or complete uh, resentment over the brutal uh, form of injustice that had been inflicted upon our poor unarmed brothers. Were you saying Sir, that or Billy do you believe Graham, that? At that time, Dr. Billy Graham was in a crusade in Chicago. And the press, your papers here in this city, uh, quoted Billy Graham of also saying that that pl uh, plane crash was an act of God. And if you take time to check the newspapers, I think that you'll find that this is correct. But no one thought that Billy Graham was so wrong when he attributed the crash of this plane to his God. But when we say that it come from our God, then we're looked upon as being, well, you know, outraged. I know, but you took the position that uh, this was a matter of satisfaction to you for I don't an think injustice that, done against you, and I think that that's a trifle severe. We did not think that it was a coincidence that 120 of, of the whites on this plane came from the state of Georgia, a state that has the worst record in history in the history of America for the mistreatment of black people uh, in this country. Worse than Mississippi? Uh, well, uh, they maybe are a little less... Uh, Mississippi is a little less hypocritical today than Georgia, but both of them are still practicing the same thing. Uh, now the, the whites in Georgia bite Negroes with a smile, whereas they used to bite them with a growl. But they're still being bitten, and we don't think that it, that it is any worse to be bitten with a smile than it is to be bitten with a growl. No worse. Mr. Calvert. While we're on the subject of uh, no Mississippi, worse, what is uh, your organization's position of what happened in Mississippi uh, in the past Such six Such as months? what? Such as the uh, James Meredith incident and the enrollment of him in the university. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants justice for <coughs> every one of the 20 million so-called Negroes. And to just take one Negro and stick him in, in college uh, with, uh, with the aid of six, I think it's six, uh, 15,000 troops and at a cost of $6,000 is a disgrace. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a farce. It's hypocrisy. Because if it's right for uh, one Negro to be forced into that university, then every Negro in the state of Mississippi who is qualified has the same right to go to that university. And if the government is not uh, ready and willing to uh, enforce the right of every Negro in the state of Mississippi, then uh, in my opinion, sir, it's only hypocrisy to pretend that uh, they are for justice uh, by pushing one Negro in and blowing it up all over the world to make it look like they're solving the problem when millions of black people in that state are still going to uh, segregated schools and getting an inferior education. Does your organization encourage members to uh, uh, attempt to enter schools that have been known as all white? In the, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't discourage us from attending white schools, but he does say that uh, it is better for us to go to our own schools and after we have a thorough knowledge of ourselves, of our own kind, and uh, racial dignity has been uh, instilled within us, then we can go to anyone's school and we'll still retain our race pride, our racial dignity, and we will be able to avoid the subservient inferiority complex that most Negroes have or are, that is instilled within most Negroes who receive this sort of integrated education. Well, you have a private school operation operating here in Chicago, at least, and possibly elsewhere, uh, and it's been a subject of controversy lately. Uh, what is the acceptance of people who come out of your private schools into uh, schools of higher learning? Yes, we have many uh, students who have graduated from the University of Islam on 54th and Greenwood that uh, are now attending other schools. In fact, just as an example, one of Mr. Muhammad's sons never attended any school in his life but the University of Islam. He later attended DePaul University. He also attended the University of Chicago, and at present he's attending, he's attending Al-Azhar University in Cairo, one of the oldest Muslim schools in the world. <coughs> and his uh, daughter-in-law also, who went to school here, is attending uh, the University of Cairo. 
And then we have other students who have graduated that are attending other colleges and universities in this country. And in our school, we never have any delinquency problems. We never have any dropouts. We never have any uh, uh, disrespect for authority or disrespect for, for, for parents. We don't have any kind of juvenile delinquency. All of the things that the regular school system is complaining about, uh, the critics and the most severe critics of Mr. Muhammad have to, uh, has to admit that we, don't, we aren't plagued with those same problems in our own school. I have listened to uh, uh, your leader at least on one occasion in convention here. It was two years ago, and, and at that time he uh, advocated uh, the separate state proposition of uh, giving the uh, what you call the so-called American Negro a separate state in which to live to make their own way. Uh, would you explain that philosophy, please? And have you had any support for it from anybody uh, in official ranks? Your first question first. To my understanding, what Mr. Muhammad has said is, that he wants freedom, justice, and equality for the black people here in America, which you agree they don't have. If they did, you wouldn't have a race problem. And he says, if America cannot bring about freedom, justice, and equality for our people in this country, then America should allow us to leave. If we can't get along together, we should, allow, we should be allowed to, to depart and go someplace where we can set up housekeeping for ourselves. Then he says, if America doesn't want us to go back home among our own people, and at the same time they want to keep us here, since we can't stay here and get along together in peace, he says what America should do is separate part of the country and give us a section where we can live and give us everything we need to get our particular uh, section functioning independently, uh, support us for 25 years until we are able to function independently in a society of our own, and in this way the problem will be solved. Mr. McCune, you say there's no juvenile delinquency. What uh, is the discipline that you Oh, number teach, one, excuse me, practice. sir. Uh, one of the first things that Mr. Muhammad teaches is you have to set an example if you want others to do right. And he teaches the grown-up Muslims to live a highly disciplined and a highly moral a life of high morals. And by the parents uh, displaying the highest of morals in front of the children at all times, automatically this sets a pattern or an example for the children. And in our schools, our children, the emphasis is, is placed upon the recognition of authority. And uh, by the children recognizing authority and respecting authority, uh, it's easy for anyone who is in authority to teach the child and discipline the child and make the child aware of the importance of living a life in accord with, with the law even after he grows up. How did you happen to join the Muslim movement? I was in prison. Uh, I was a very wayward, criminal, backward, illiterate, uneducated, and whatever other negative uh, characteristics you can think of type of person until I heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And because of the impact that it had upon me in giving me a desire to reform myself and rehabilitate myself for the first time in my life and also being able to see the effect that it had upon others, this is what made me accept it. And plus, uh, prior to hearing what he teaches, I had no interest whatsoever in anything serious or any kind of educational pursuits. And I noticed that after being uh, exposed to the religious teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, immediately it instilled within me such a high degree of racial pride and racial dignity that I wanted to be somebody. And I realized that I couldn't be anybody by begging uh, the white man for what he had, but that I had to get out here and try and do something for myself or make something out of myself. What has been the growth of the Muslim movement? There are conflicting reports as to how many Muslims there are in the United States. Can you tell us? Well, most critics say that the dissatisfied follow Muhammad, that the unemployed and the oppressed follow Muhammad. And I think you'll agree the sociologists, the economists, and other experts say that the masses of black people are dissatisfied, unemployed, oppressed, and fed up. So that he actually gets his support uh, at the mass level. But now you have other Negroes at the class level who pretend not to go for him because usually their job uh, has been given to them by the white man. They, are, they have positions to which they have been appointed, and they uh, think that the only way that they can protect their job is by pretending in, the front, in front of the white man that they don't go for Mr. Muhammad either. But you well, find how, how many Muslims do you level. say there are in, the, in numbers? I couldn't say. I've never heard him say, and he's the only one who would know. 500,000? I couldn't say. Uh, I think that uh, anyone who does say is not in a position to know, and anyone who knows wouldn't say. What do you think that uh, the Urban League and the uh, NAACP have accomplished for your people? What's your attitude well, toward that? in their them? own way, they have been doing their best to bring about freedom, justice, and equality, and human dignity for the black people in this country. 
But today you have such a, uh, an intense degree of dissatisfaction and impatience existing among our people at the mass level that it is almost impossible to come to them with a program that's going to take another hundred years to solve their problem and they still be satisfied to wait. So that they have, the Urban League and the NAACP has done a good job within their understanding. But today it takes uh, more uh, uh, immediate solutions. And the solution that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has is immediate. It's and more you practical. think they're not moving fast enough? Well, they're moving as fast as they can. But that's not fast enough for the masses of black people. If a person is sitting on a warm stove and you get ready to let him up, no matter how slow you are, he has patience because he, it's only warm. But the masses of black people who are sitting on a hot stove, they're impatient. And no matter how fast you say progress is being made toward letting them up, that progress is not fast enough for them. Well, see, <clears throat> what they're trying to do there is get Malcolm to say something bad about the Urban League and the NAACP. So you say they're not moving fast enough, you know, and Malcolm is steady trying to say where well, they're moving as fast as they as they can, you know. So are they doing a good job? They're doing a job the best they can as far as the, the level of their understanding. Malcolm is not saying anything bad about them, he would later say, because he understood how white people would try to put pit one organization against the other. And though he would eventually publicly uh, degrade some people and some black leaders uh, for being what he characterized as Uncle Tom's, uh, for the most part, he would not do that publicly. And that's what this dude is here is trying to get him to do, is to say something disparaging about the other groups. But Malcolm just said that Mr. Muhammad's plan is more immediate, that black people are no longer sitting on a warm stove, that they're sitting on a hot stove. And they want resolution, and they want resolution now. Period. Jeez. Fucking part you can't understand, boy. Well, the NAACP and the Urban League have both been critical of the of the Muslim. The NAACP well, and Urban League have been maneuvered into criticizing see, us against their own will. Still, Usually the, the divide and conquer tactics have it. always been used by the oppressor to keep the oppressed oppressed. And the NAACP has been used against the Muslims. Efforts have been made to use us against them. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says he'll work with the NAACP, the Urban League, and any other Negro organization that wants to uplift the black man as long as it doesn't conflict with our religious principles. Well, I remember once when Elijah was quoted as having said that the Urban League and the NAACP sold out to the white man. Has he ever made that statement? Uh, to, to my your... knowledge, I don't think that he has said that uh, they sold out to the white man. I've heard him say that. Is that his feeling? Uh, the, the NAACP has been an example existence for 54 years and, for, and they, they elect a new national president every year and they have never elected a black man to sit in that capacity. Arthur Spingarn has been president of the NAACP for 24 years and so in this sense it means that either they're practicing the same discrimination that they accuse the white man of practicing, they're practicing it themselves or else they're not qualifying other Negroes in that organization for the positions of leadership. This is our only criticism. Do you personally uh, feel that they have sold out to the white man? Those organ Do you personally feel that those organizations have uh, sold out to the white man? I don't think that uh, they would knowingly allow themselves to be used or misused against their own people. So if they are failing to do the job that, their pe that our people are expect of them, probably it's just through lack of understanding. But today their understanding is increasing and you'll find that they're developing a, a better ability to work with all different factions for the betterment of our people. Uh, Malcolm, how do you yourself feel about the white man? I believe that the white man has done a great injustice to the black man in this country mm -hmm. by having kidnapped our people and, uh, and brought us here and down to the level that we're on today. And today, instead of approaching the factors that their uh, or original mistake has created, Instead of approaching these factors objectively and realistically, the greatest sin that they're doing now is trying, by, is trying to pretend that they never committed a crime, that they never did any wrong. And when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad points out the injustices that our people are suffering, this, they, they, they uh, make that sin worse by accusing him of teaching hate or by accusing him of, of uh, black supremacy or by accusing him of advocating violence simply because he is pointing out the we, real factors we, we in the problem. We have a little time left. You don't have to hurry so much, Malcolm. 
You were yeah, born in Omaha. Yes, sir. And you left, your family left Omaha when you were what, one year old? I imagine yeah, the, about a year old. And why did they leave yeah, Stop. Omaha? Well, to my understanding, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, burned down one of their homes in, uh, in, uh, in Omaha. This, a lot of Ku Klux this made your family feel very unhappy, I'm sure. Well, insecure, if not unhappy. So you must have a somewhat prejudiced point of view, a personally prejudiced point of view. In other words, you cannot look at this in a broad academic sort of way, really. I, I, I think that's incorrect, because uh, despite the fact that that happened in Omaha, and then when we moved to Lansing, Michigan, our home was burned down again. In fact, my father was killed by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and despite all of that, so no one right. was more... ...pin racism, you see? And that's how America have been has been painting Malcolm X for decades. They finally began to come around in, in the recent years, putting Malcolm X on a stamp and this sort of stuff. I'm going to get deeper into Malcolm X. I'm even going to get into who unalived Malcolm X and why, the inside story, what really transpired. But here you see that the guy before him, he's steady trying to, Get Malcolm X to say something bad, as I said, about the other black organizations. Well, they said that they had a problem with the Muslims, he says. And Malcolm said, no, they have been maneuvered into believing or saying that they had a problem with the nation of Islam. But they're steady trying to get him to say something bad about them. They're just trying to start trouble. But Malcolm X is aware, and he's not going for it. Then this guy comes, and he asks Malcolm X, how does he feel about white people? Malcolm X is trying to answer him. And he said, well, slow down, Malcolm, slow down. We have time. Because Malcolm is brilliant, and he has a quick response for every question. All four of them are coming at him with different questions, different subjects. And Malcolm quickly, as if he already know what the question is going to be, is responding intelligently. And maintaining his poise throughout, and they don't know how to handle it. That's the bottom damn line. Thoroughly integrated with whites than I. No one has lived more so in the society of whites than I. And uh, it was only until I became a Muslim that I ceased living in the society you of whites. You say you are thoroughly integrated with the whites, Malcolm. Oh, yes. Do you have white people in your family background? Definitely. Most Negroes in this country have whites in their family background. How, because how are you going to differentiate between the white blood that's in you and the Negro blood that's in you? And you don't mind my using the no, Negro because well, you use this yourself. I use it interchangeably. I know you do. Uh, Why do you do that? Well, I use it uh, if it fits the purpose to use it, but I, I use see. it against my will. Do you? Uh, but you, use use it against it, you, my... you used it uh, voluntarily in describing the incident in Los Angeles. Still, and... I use it against my will. I guess the teachings weren't <laughs> thoroughly inculcated. No, right? but when I say to you that the uh, cops in Los Angeles shot down seven unarmed Negroes, mm -hmm. every Negro in the audience knows what I'm talking about. But when I say that he shot, that they shot uh, seven uh, Muslims, then a lot of the Negroes don't realize. I suppose that you said seven colored Negroes. people because you say you use the term colored people. You said I don't think I use the word colored. colored on this program. Yes, you did. You did when we started. Not colored. Out. I think so. Black people, I'm sorry. You black. Say black. Well, we can use black, and that fits everybody. <laughs> okay. But sir, the black... Now, let me get back to another point that you made. You said that uh, you go back home. Now, what do you mean by back home? I've only heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say, back among our own people. From you whence said we... back home. You yes. don't mind my saying Right, that. back home. But by that, do he you, means... Do you mean back into uh, the uh, roots of, is of uh, Islam, or do you mean back to Africa? Back home. And Africa. by back home, he means back into our original uh, civilization, and if you study history, the Islamic culture existed in West Africa, Central Africa. But your Central family Africa. didn't come from uh, an Isla Islamic background originally, did it? I mean, you came from, from the proud tribes of Africa, which is I think you find, pride, sir, that one of the, background. that Islam, the Islamic culture, a, I agree, there is a, existed a of, widely in Africa, Central well, Africa, agree, West Africa. I agree, I've met many people in there. Mr. O'Connor. With regard to that uh, tragedy out there in Los Angeles, uh, I myself refer to it when it happened as the tragic police action, so I am not totally biased. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming the from uh, Muhammad Speaks, which is the publication of your, uh, your cult or your religion, uh, cult. Elijah Poole, Elijah Muhammad, uh, Elijah referred Poole. to the policemen out there, the white policemen, as devils. Uh, he said, there is no justice here for us black people. There is no future for us nor our children in civilized America. Uh, doesn't that uh, imply that you're going to get out or that's his wish that you get out? If he referred to those policemen out there as devils, 
who had who were heavily armed and knew that the men, the Negroes whom they were shooting down in cold blood were not heavily armed, I don't think that those policemen themselves would deny that they're devils, nor would any Negro who witnessed such a deed deny that they are devils. Well, about the other part of it, there's no justice here for us black people. There's no future for us, nor our children in civilized America. And I didn't make that up. He, he said it in his own... He, and he's correct in what he says, sir. Well, what does it mean? Does uh, it mean you're going to get out or It what? means the same thing that Attorney General Robert Kennedy means when he says that the number one domestic problem in America is the race problem that it is almost impossible to solve it. It's almost impossible to give justice to Negroes. One brief thing uh, further. I read also in Mohammed Speaks a quotation that, that uh, Elijah Mohammed is the only uh, person on earth who is the personal, who was on personal speaking terms with God. Do you believe that? Definitely. You do? Definitely. We're going to have to leave it at that. And Malcolm, I'm sure he's done a good job in rehabilitating you. It was a pleasure to have you on City Desk. I'm in Chicago for the... Wow. So there you have it, people. He referred to him as Elijah Poo, even though Malcolm asked him not to do that already, said that his name was Elijah Muhammad. He said, are you guys going to get out? Or are you guys going to go back? He's they're cutting Malcolm off, but he maintained his poise and his emotional intelligence throughout. We can all learn a lot from this. And I'm going to get more into Malcolm, as I said. In fact, I'm going to do another video. I don't care if two people watch it. Just two people uh, on, uh, on Malcolm, where he had an interview at Berkeley, and uh, it was crazy. But <clears throat> I'm going to have to get into Malcolm a, a lot more, his story, his life. As I said, and what really happened, there's a lot of misconceptions about Malcolm X, and I can clear some of them up, and that's it. Uh, I've studied him and I've studied his life for many years. Studied black history for many years. As some of you can probably tell. Our brother Malcolm. As he was uh, lovingly referred to, brother Malcolm. Uh, the black prince he was also referred to. And, uh, his death still bothers me. I still feel it all these years later. Rest in peace, Malcolm. I'll be back with more on Malcolm soon, y'all. Do something good on Malcolm. Yeah. Mm. Stay free, people!